thank you that you called me one of the top minds in patient advocacy. Absolutely. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> from. From my conversations with you. Oh, okay. It's, as, as you can tell, um, I'm not the biggest fan of wonderful visuals. Um, I've become that way since my vision has become an issue. And so uh, I don't tend to use a lot of visuals because I embarrass myself when I try to read my own visuals. So um, I'm just going to do a, an audio kind of presentation. I do have a couple of visuals I want to share with you. Um, but generally, this is going to be a Phil Donahue kind of style nice. discussion. We're, we're going to uh, we're going to laugh a little bit. We're going to commiserate a little bit. But one thing I'd like to do is invite you to come with me into an area of thinking that I think we sometimes don't give enough uh, airtime to in our own hearts and our own souls. And I'm talking about how it is that hope really works. Now, I'm not saying how hope touches the soul, how hope motivates our heart, how hope keeps our families together in hard times. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how does hope work in the world in which we live, amongst systems, amongst organizations, amongst policy. You know, how, how is hope part of that narrative? And then after, after we talk about a, a few things uh, related to the reality of hope, you could say, um, we're gonna talk a, a little bit about where the patient position is. And uh, I'm not gonna opine on my own experience. There are people in this room, uh, our narratives, we already know are amazing. Um, so this isn't gonna be about sharing our narrative. It's going to be about owning our narrative, Rec reclaiming ownership of our narrative, and why that's important. And then I'm going to get really radical, and I'm glad that I have some classic scientists and doctors here, um, because my radicalism in this particular way is, is not the norm. But I'm going to put it out there in good faith and just make us ask the question and make us look inside. Because I think that we're at an inflection point in our policy, in social advocacy, in health policy advocacy, in regulatory advocacy. We're at an inflection point, at least in this country, where we have to decide pretty soon where our time is best spent to be most effective for the goals that are our interest. And that's hard to do when you're a do-gooder and you want to help everybody. It's hard to look to your own interest. So I'm going to try to teach us. I'm trying, trying to get us a, into an experience where we're not afraid to ask ourselves, what do I want? What do I need? What am I spending my time on? Is it effective? Am I mad? How does that work? We're going to talk a little bit more like there won't be a lot of opportunity for sharing testimonies, but we will have some time for questions. I'm not on a schedule. Everyone else probably is. Uh, so we can always take some time for questions afterward if people are totally going out. So how does that all sound? Very good. Good. All right. So I am going to depend on my trusty phone for some notes while I talk. I'd like to share with you just a couple of, of quotes on what hope is. I've got three quotes that are sort of fun that I want to share. Once you choose hope, anything is possible. And the person that that quote is accredited to is Christopher Reed. A second one, hope is the only bee that makes honey without flowers. That's very telling. And that was by Robert Greene's Ingersoll. And then this third one is my favorite. I sometimes cringe when I hear people talk about hope. 
they'll say there's hope for this or a cure for that or a hope for a cure for this or that. And then they'll stop. Hope needs action. No action, no hope. And that was by Francis Collins. During an interview Keith, that you watched me do an interview at Christmas time uh, a number of years ago because you came up and took pictures. And, and, um, that's Francis Collins, and he, he should know, right? Right. And I'd like to focus on the third. No action, no hope. Number one, is that really true? Can we tell ourselves that as patients and still believe that we're doing all good things? I think we can, but it begs the question in terms of what do we do for action? I, uh, I became sort of a poster child for a Gen 1 stem cell treatment that I had for macular degeneration that's in here. I had a great result, and I've heard a lot of talk about being an N of 1 um, and how important it is to maintain curiosity and identity when you're an N of 1. And so thank you for those who are reusing that term. Um, and after being a poster child, and um, you know, it's hard to do at 53 years old, but people put up with it. Um, after becoming a poster child, I decided to use my own skills to do whatever I could to bring research money uh, into regenerative medicine. Well, one sort of unintended consequence of my activities was that there were a number of people that approached me Every, every one from politicians to radio talk show people, um, you know, to doctors, they approached me all of a sudden wanting me to come and tell my story to different groups. And I, you know, was a deer in the headlights. You know? I, I thought, well, this is really great. And so I, I obliged at just about every request. And I learned a few things, and that's what I'd like to pass on to you today. Narratives sell. They sell. But information is what empowers us. And think about that just for a moment. And as patient advocates, how often have has your narrative been co-opted? Now, I'm, sure, now I'm not trying to be negative, but how useful has your narrative become to other people to get their message and their agenda across? The typical thing that I started facing in some small groups would be I would present my story and get a lot of nice, nice compliments and a lot of amazement but the story, I was always presenting the last slot of the last day of the conference, whatever it was, as sort of the patient feel-good story that everybody could go home saying wasn't that nice. And two-thirds of the people that attended the conference were already on their way back to the airport. Have you ever had that experience? That's disturbing. It's disturbing because it's telling of where our society may actually be when it comes to empowering patient advocates. So we can look and we can dig a little deeper. And if you dig too deep, you know, you'll want to go and slash your wrist. That you, <laughs> you're just not having any impact at all. That cynicism is not part of this conversation. But if we take a close look, we can ask ourselves as patient advocates of now a future technology, a disruptive technology, is now also the time to shed or molt the shell that tends to be built around us, to shed that and emerge with new rules. And that's what I want to challenge you to think about today. New rules. New rules. Not the same rules that we hear about, not the same systems that we hear about, 
And you might say, well, Doug, you know, you're anti-establishment or you're anti-FDA or you're anti-fill in the three-letter, you know, acronym. No, I'm not. I absolutely am not. I'm not anti-Big Pharma. I'm not anti-anything like that. But I believe that I've, I've come to believe that narrative sell information and powers and there are a lot of people's needs that are never going to be met. It's not going to happen with our current systems. That might seem pessimistic, but maybe it's realistic. Because the people who are fighting for rare diseases get, get that all the time. Their narrative can be used for people's advantage. They're doing great things to raise awareness, but somehow, some way, most of it slips away. And we're left with exhausted advocates. We're left with weakened systems, not stronger systems. More obfuscation in policy, more confusion, more runaround. Right? So we, we look at that and we, we just take a look at the dark side just for a minute of advocacy. What does that teach us? Well, if we, if we take the time to exhale and breathe, maybe we're spending our time, our 23 hours a day on Earth, I'm not counting makeup time, by the way, um, or male, male makeup time, whatever they do too. But I'm not talking about 24, I'm talking about 23 hours. What, how are we going to spend that time? And is it being spent efficiently? Very simple questions. So if you're spending your time trying to move a mountain and you have a lot of people with you and that mountain, mountain is moving, then you're going somewhere. But if that mountain is not moving, does it make sense to change the rules? And I'm saying, yes, it does. So we have a few alternatives. Without action, there is no hope. What kind of action can we involve ourselves in? We see some wonderful policy work on the forefront. Uh, a lot of ground, grassroots ground level work coming up, bubbling up on the forefront. All of that has to continue. But we all have a personal narrative that cuts like a knife. So how do we reclaim our narrative, use it, change the rules, and do some things ourselves? Do you believe that patients can develop drugs? Say what? No, I'm serious. How many people here have a bachelor's degree? Great. How many have a master's degree? The majority. How many have a PhD, MD, JD? How many have two PhD, JDs? In there? Oh, we've narrowed it down to two. <laughs> this, this is a smart crowd. Smart, 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 smart. Too smart, right? And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to write a clinical protocol for a clinical trial. It takes a scientist, yes. It does. It takes doctors, yes. It takes someone who's good at writing, yes. It does all of that. But the act itself is not rocket science. And we should not be intimidated about jumping in and offering our help with the process. And if somebody doesn't want our help with the process, we do it ourselves. And that's sort of what I've gotten into. I'm, I've gotten myself into a little bit of trouble that way. But I'm happy to, and I'd just like to introduce to you a couple of ways that information might empower patient autonomy. How is it that you can, you know, I, I didn't even have to ask Dr. March here. I told him about what we were going to try to do in Ukraine. And he said, if there's, you know, it wasn't like, if there's anything I can do to help, pat me on the back and walk out. Thank you. No, it, he, he looked me in the eye 
and he was serious, and he said, yeah, there's a I want help. Now, what would it be like to have Dr. March on the team to help bring some of these things? So when you build a team that's personal, and part of the reason Dr. March wants to help is because he believes in what I'm doing. He believes in the team that's trying to do it. He wants to help people, right? And I'm sorry, I didn't really need to poke the finger, but the, the, the idea is you can build it first and the help will come. That's what's happening with us. So here are a couple of ways, very simple, sort of fun, ways that information can empower patients so that they can own their narrative and take more charge of not just their destiny, but maybe create the beginnings of another system altogether to get some of these rare needs met. How many of you heard of chat GPT? How many of you are scared to death of chat GPT? Well, good. Yeah, so-so. I think that that's, that's a great response. Well, I worked on a protocol not too long ago, and I had a scientist friend who's a wonderful individual. He just got another job at a research agency after he had promised me that he would put together the preclinical justification and the clinical justification and the rationale for a protocol that we want to do in Ukraine. We want to do five clinical trials in Ukraine. And, um, and one week later, he hadn't gotten to it. Two weeks later, he hadn't gotten to it. Three years, you know, three weeks later, he hadn't got to it. Well, you know, you're asking a friend for help, and, you know, four and a half weeks later, I said, well, this isn't going to happen. So I'm going to try something. So I went to chat GPT. And I figured, I know a little something about regenerative medicine. So I went to chat GPT, and I just want to give you a quick little demo. OK, so here's, here's chat GPT-4. And Alona and I, Alona Fischenko in the back, and I were, were just testing it out this afternoon a little bit, asking it, you know, I, I'm a daughter, I'm a son or daughter of someone with Parkinson's disease, you know. Uh, it's costing a lot to take care of him. I have to work. I live near Cincinnati. What can I do? And at first, ChatGPT gives you a fairly general answer. Nothing major. You just take a perusal through that. And then you just sort of ask it a little bit more. Like, um, can you provide contact information? Well, look what it comes up with. And then you ask another question. What kind of agencies provide direct financial support? And it gives you uh, a general answer. And then you say, provide contact information. And look what it gives you. Now you can see where this goes as you further interrogate this intelligence, this uh, artificial intelligence engine, you can divide and conquer just about any question you want up to a point. You'll always have to have a human. You'll always have to have experts that go through and make sure your chat GPT isn't hallucinating, as they say, right? But chat GT GPT-4 is not known to hallucinate that much. So it's much more reliable. And so let me see if I can come up with one of my chats. Uh, let's see. I do computer program, computer programming. Let's see. Unhealing wounds. Here's a conversation that I had with ChatGPT. Write a 200 to 300 scientific and clinical explanation of the known and unknown causes for unhealing wounds, including trauma wounds. Include detailed mechanisms of action affecting tissue. Provide references, references in Chicago style format. And here's where it started. It gives me an initial justification. It's, you can see that it has references that it's citing, 
and then it gives me the list of references. It took it 15 seconds to do that. Patients can be dangerous with this kind of information, right? But, I mean, it's sort of fun to watch. But I drill down a little further. Address none of the causes rather than the contributors. Oh, I, I address more of the causes rather than their contributors. What do you think of this, Keith? Sound reasonable? It's a good beginning, right? Of the justification behind wound healing. Ian? Yes? And it provided references. Then I say, now give me scientific and clinical explanation of the pathophysiology for unhealing wounds, including trauma wounds. And it explains how the pathology actually occurs. Now, I used ChatGPT for about two hours on a Sunday afternoon after my scientist friend finally gave up the ghost and said, look, you know, I've got this new job, awfully sorry, but it's not gonna happen, right? And that is something that we have to deal with. We are, we get let down, you know, every once in a while. But he'll do it next time, you know, it, it just it ran into a life situation. I spent two hours on a Sunday afternoon and got a full preclinical, clinical, clinical trials, justification and rationale with 80 references, all under 10 years old, for use of umbilical cord, mesenchymal stem cells, for the treatment of wounds with all kinds of different routes of administration. I wrapped it up, cut and pasted it, did what I could as an educated layman, right? Passed it off to the scientists to check. That's two months worth of work done in two hours. That's how patients can begin to own the process. And it cost me $20 a month. Now, this particular AI isn't the only kind of AI that can be helpful. And so there are legal AIs. There's one that's coming out called Harvey, which will help the law industry. So if you have legal concerns, you can look at that. The, the medical industry is beginning to, multiple medical industries are forming their own relationship with AI. We have health concerns and confidentiality concerns that they're all dealing with. But for basic literature review research, you, you could do as good a job as I do. And 90% of what I produce is gonna end up in that protocol, and it's gonna be hot and good. So that's just a little thing about chat. Anybody have any questions or comments about that? Go ahead. Yes, there is a bit of an art to the prompting of an artificial intelligence, and it does take some time. But most of us in this room are clinical thinkers. We're used to deductive reasoning. We're used to forming a hypothesis, and, and we're used to uh, asking questions in reverse order, drilling down which would be a, like a clinical diagnosis, right? So you begin with the broad, and then you rule out, and then you come up with a hypothesis, and you narrow that down a little bit more, and you rule out, and then the more experience that you get, the faster you can get down to the bottom and know how to ask the question. So it does take a little practice, but uh, yes, I'd be happy to show you some of these examples. Any other questions? Sorry. What is my what? Did you share it with the person who was originally going to uh, do this for you? Your scientist friend, did you share it with that person? No, no. <laughs> he, I think he would be pleasantly surprised because, like I said, people are doing this for the right reasons. 
and they just want to see it work. Right? So, yep, anybody else? Okay. Let me talk about stem cell clinics. <laughs> juicy. It's still juicy. So, like I mentioned earlier, are you picking this up all right? I think you have to be <laughs> Oh, okay. So, so sorry. This feels so formal. But, um, where was I? Oh, stem cell clinics. I, I received my therapy from a retinal surgeon in Florida who is experimenting with bone marrow aspirate, autologous from my own hip, and is exper gathering data, not, uh, not a robust manner, in a robust manner, but probably a clinically relevant manner, um, uh, on what mechanisms of action might help on different eye conditions. He's been doing it for years. He's done it here, he's done it in Germany, he's done it in Dubai, it, you know, he's an MIT trained engineer. He's not a slouch. Um, so I felt relatively safe. But he gave me, I, I opted in for an unapproved stem cell treatment for my macular degeneration and I got really good results. Um, I know I'm not an N of one. I know that there are others, but I'm, I'm the one that took off, right? And so, but it was a general, it's a simple treatment. It's not very sophisticated. It's not nearly where we are today. Um, but my point being that uh, patients make decisions based on what their needs are. And sometimes those decisions aren't as well informed as they could be. And I would counter that with doctors make decisions, right, about what they believe in. And sometimes those decisions aren't as well informed as it could be. It's part of the human condition. We all face this. Um, but the stem cell clinic industry has uh, rightly been under fire and uh, under criticism for several types of problems they have in messaging to the public. Advertising, you know, claims, you name it. The list is long. So with the help of my colleague, uh, Dr. David Harrell in the back, he and I developed software that scans stem cell clinics websites uses a heuristics model that is powered by AI to evaluate the language on websites and then asks the question, might this heuristic trigger signal a problem with regulatory compliance? Or might it signal a problem with ethics? Or might it show that there's educational merit to the site? Or is it purporting an evidence-based focus? Um, I forget what the third one is, uh, the fifth one. I can't. I never remember the fifth one. But anyway, so we developed the software. We scanned every website that FDA sent, and it has come to our attention letter. To so they send out these preliminary letters that says, "We see you. You're doing this. We're advising you that this isn't good." We urge you to, right? And it's, they're literally called, it has come to our attention letters. Where they came up with that, I don't know. But, so we evaluated uh, over 200 such letters and we scanned the websites and we used this AI driven model to determine if there are patterns in patient messaging that can be predicted and whether providers who are using marketing agencies to give patient messages, public messaging, whether we can help them and educate them to say, hey, back off here because you know, you've got too much of this going on in your site. You've got to be more responsible than that because here's what patients are going to think and this is why patients 
might have a problem ultimately with the way that you're saying this. So we created this program called the Practice, the Program, excuse me, Program for Analytics and Compliance Education, or PACE. And this is just a few of the metrics that you can get with PACE. The first sunburst chart is the aggregate of all of the sites, and it's divided into the purple, which is regulatory, the turquoise is what? D dedicated, what is the first one? I can't see it. Uh, this educational merit, and then there's ethics. Oh, and then there's provider patient relationship. That's the other one that I forgot. And there's evidence based focused. So you can see that in the aggregate, according to our heuristics model, it is not surprising, but the area of ethics and regulatory got the most hits with the AI algorithm. So these are interactive charts. So you can now look at exactly what categories in ethics. And one of them, which I always like to, to, uh, to comment on, is call to action. And that's this one right here. So when you have a website that has seven different opportunities for a patient to take action now, Call us for an appointment, free consultation, schedule a talk, come here, you know. When you have seven of those impressions hit your eyes as a patient on every single page, you got a problem with ethics, right? <laughs> so it, you, you have to educate people as to why that's important. So it's not judgmental, it's an education tool. Go ahead. So given that given the processes that you went through, it, it's possible that the ethical problems are really just with the language, but what they're actually doing is okay. Is that possible? It's possible, and there it, there is a sliver. I would say maybe uh, just off the cuff, maybe 15 or 20 percent of those practitioners, particularly in the orthopedics field, the orthopedics uh, field seems to be quite responsible in the way that they're using off-label kinds of, right. Um, but other fields, you know, you know, they go nuts. When you have a plastic surgeon who's trying to cure cancer, you get a problem. Right? <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Right. Yeah. So it, that's to your question. Yes, we have found that there is a sliver of folks. And some of the ways you might see that is in the category of educational merit. Mm -hmm. So if a provider is really into providing education to patients, you might be able to infer that if that data is okay, you could infer that maybe there's something good happening here, too. So it gives someone like myself or another patient an idea of where the problems are in communicating through websites. FDA doesn't even use a tool like this. They, they have people they have people that sit down and click on websites and write notes. You should offer that to them. Well, say, we're talking to them. We're talking to them about it, but I you know. That's what you were going to tell us that you were doing. <laughs> no, well, I mean, we could, but here, so here is a specific stem cell clinic. You see, I've I've starred out the name. This is someone who actually got a letter. So look at their ethics. Right here's their regulatory. So if you just want a quick compare, I'll go back to the, to the main chart. Typically, regulatory and ethics were equal amongst the aggregate. But when you scroll up, it's like, okay. So if you were consulting or if you were educating a doctor, his legal team, whomever, her legal team, and you were to have a conversation, this would be the tool to say, let's take, you know, what are we gonna hit first? Well, let's look at ethics. And why is it that your site comes off as being pretty darn unethical? <laughs> right. And so it gives an opportunity for a practitioner to lean into compliance. Sometimes they don't care about the consequences. No, truly, yeah. they don't. Uh -huh. They basically say, I'm doing what I'm doing. If FDA's got a problem, let them come after me. 
I'll change my website, you know, I mean, they don't care, some of them. But most of them, they'd rather avoid that if they could. And so this piques their interest. So this is an aggregate against a site. And I'll just show you, uh, here's another one. This is the geographic distribution of letters that the FDA sent out. This is where the company is, by the way. So in case you know of something that's in there, there. But these are all color coded, like the yellow. The yellow circle means that in the domain of ethics, the yellow circle means they're in the top 50 percentile. The Good blue, huh? Good bad. 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 So that's why it's yellow, it's like a warning. Uh, and there's one, and I think it's this one, that... You got a gold star? <laughs> no, no, that just says this is where they are located. We might be able to find one that's red. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. And so the colors of the dots are different. Are different uh, addressing credentials. Okay. Like I believe the red ones are where where the, the addressee was an MD or a DO. So they're classically trained medical doctor who's gotten a letter from FDA. All right. The blues are chiropractors, right? And then we have other categories of credential that we go down to. What could a patient, well, one thing that I figured out as soon as I looked at this, look how FDA is targeting the whole country. That's true. You know, no one's going to Montana necessarily, or Wyoming. <laughs> but look at Florida, look at Texas, look at California, look at New York. They're, they're, they're closing ranks. Now, whether it's on purpose or whether they're just doing it, I don't know. But the patterns you can see. Go ahead. I, I just, you know, it's pretty clear that they're going after, or whatever terminology you use, more locations where there are higher population centers, right? Like nobody lives in Montana. Right? So nobody well, wants a stem cell clinic there because nobody lives there. I think that's a, I think that's nonsense. Uh, to be truthful, I, I don't think there really is a connection to the population. Yeah. I think it's I think it's connection to the practice, or because Utah, for instance, Utah is a vast state. There are some Regen Med clinics there. We all know of some of them. Uh, not a lot of people necessarily. So I, I mean, you might have a point. Uh, say that again, Vidya. No, this is software. Oh, FDA does it manually. This is objective data using algorithms. Now, the algorithms need tweaking constantly. Right. I think Dr. March made a really good point, though, a lot. Like, if look at San Diego and look at Florida. Mm -hmm. It's age. Could <laughs> 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 be the number of minutes. So what are we going to do about health span? <laughs> exactly. This is a health span conference. Is this, is this, is this the future of health span? <laughs> no, it is, it is not. The, the health span movement is, is totally based on an ethical approach to longevity. And yeah. They're doing all the things the right way. So we wish them the best as they move forward. These folks, however, have already been notified by FDA. Interesting. Right. Interesting. So they're our control group, and then we measure sites up against that. So back to the reason for this talk. How does this kind of information empower patients to take not to help people, but to take control and do bold things, like develop drugs. This, this kind of education tool is powerful. You could educate members of an association who you know are flitting off to uh, exploitative operations. 
you, you could sit down with them for half an hour and just show them, here is why we steer you this way. Here is why we might steer you that way. It's a powerful tool. And the very last graphic is probably the easiest one to understand. This is all of the categories. This is, these are percentiles. So, so this is XYZ company. It's a different company, you see. And these are percentiles. So the slash marks are the aggregate. And you'll see they overlap with the solid. So even though you're seeing slash marks, if you, whatever's dark green is, is the company, and whatever is clear with slash marks would be the aggregate. And you'll see they play back and forth. But what we look for here, if you look at the categories, this will tell you, is the aggregate more percentile? So in this case, we have, we have conditions treated. That would be, oh, we treat MS or ALS, or, right? They're making claims whatever conditions they're treating. It's clear here that the aggregate is more active and that this, they're a little bit lower than that. So you might want to explore why that is. On the other hand, when it, com when it comes to, say, calls from action, now calls from action would be avoid surgery, come get our stem cells. We're calling you calling you away from an action, which is beneficial. So you have call to action, which is come to us, and then you call from action, saying you don't want them, right? So the calls from action, this particular site, tends to say avoid costly surgery, or no side effects, or write some other phraseology that would draw a patient away from standard of care. And so you have all of the categories here and the percentiles. Now, granted, I geeked you out a little bit on data, but the bottom line is how can we as patients actually empower ourselves exactly. in, instead of spinning our wheels? Yeah. And I'm taking it to a point where I'm saying you could even develop drugs. You don't have to wait. You have scientist friends. You have doctor friends, you have people who want to help you. Go to them, ask for help, raise a bit of money, get started. If you build it, the larger people will come. Imagine what it would be like to, on a shoestring, be able to do a clinical trial up to phase 2A, even 2B. If you design it right, you can get there. We're planning on doing this, and I'll close with the Ukraine initiative, but we're planning on doing this for less than $250,000 per trial. That's peanuts. By treating wounded soldiers and civilians in Ukraine with perinatal birth products that are already under IND here in the US. It's win, 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 win. It's win all over, right? Less, less than $250,000 per trial. That's not out of reach for most people to raise money. What would it be like to identify something that the system is not going to address with you or anyone else? It's, you want it to happen, it's not gonna happen. So you make it. What's that? So you make it. So you do it yourself, with a little help from your friends. It, it works, it works. Our first IND, which Vidya, thanks to her, David, I think you had something to do with it too. I wrote the, I, the IND. It got submitted and approved on the first submission with one comment from FDA. Not even using chat GPT? No, this was done the old fashioned way. And the, and, the, and the strategy was, we went to Kansas University Medical Center, who had an MSC product they were testing for ALS. And we said, would you like us to go after Parkinson's using your product? We, we found 
a, a group of six stem cell clinics that had doctors that wanted to do a trial with Parkinson's. We put them together. They made a deal. Before you know it, we had an FDA clinical trial for Parkinson's using umbilical cord MSCs for Kansas University Medical Center. Yes, Keith. How, how many people uh, were authorized and how far are you in the trial? Yet? It, the trial is just wrapping up its phase one. We're preparing a 2B because it's regenerative medicine and we've got the data. We think that we'll get a 2B. Um, but we're already putting the protocol together for a 2B. And with RMAT, with regenerative medicine advanced therapies designation, we've already gotten back from the FDA that this qualifies for an RMAT. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna try to get the trial up to 2B. Guess what happens when you have a 2B trial and you put a bow on it and you present it. You say, "Here's a 2B trial." They'll come. They'll come. But not they won't take the risk up front. So patients have nothing to lose, everything to gain. There's nothing wrong with taking the risk up front doing your best and people will help you. And the last thing I want to say, I want to just let everybody know that this is the ultimate of the ultimate of the ultimate for patients. And that's our Ukraine project. And I'm so proud that we have with us today uh, Alona Vyshchenko in the back sitting with David. Alona has refugee status here with her daughter She's here from Ukraine, and she lives here in North Carolina. She's, a, she's an attorney in Ukraine, in Kyiv, and um, she's also our legal analyst who's doing all of the translation work, all of the going back and forth, you know, with eight or 10 hours difference or whatever it is with people in Ukraine. And we now have a preliminary understanding, which is just before the agreement, that we will be conducting up to five clinical trials for wounded and complicated wound healing in Ukraine using perinatal birth products which are already under IND in the United States. So the advantage to that is you find a, you find a small hungry company who has an IND and is all dressed up and has nowhere to go. They can't afford to do the trial. They're, they're running out of money, um, but they're passionate and they have this product that FDA is not concerned about the manufacturing of. That's the biggest part. So FDA is comfortable with the manufacturing. You go to that company and you say, would you like us to get human data in Ukraine and bring that data back to the United States and introduce it to the FDA? And the answer is hell yeah. Of course they would, right? And so we have formed a coalition of companies and we're continuing to build that coalition through a, a holding company that we established amongst us. We're treating it like a nonprofit, but we're bringing it, we're bringing those pieces together and we're going to be treating by the way, the person on the screen now is Yaku Fischchenko, and he happens to be uh, Alona's spouse. And he is going to be—he's Professor uh, Fischchenko. He is a chief researcher um, at the Institute of Traumatology and Orthopedics in Ukraine, in Kiev, Ukraine. He's going to be conducting and overseeing the studies. And we're on this web page. We're interviewing him uh, for for the reason. But so that's what patients can do. We don't have to wait. It's hard, hard work. But I would submit to you, it might not be as hard as trying to advocate against a system that has so many things going against it for response time. I know how exhausting it is to advocate. I know patients have a certain amount of strength. Sometimes we just burn out. I 
until the next advocate comes along. This is what I'm trying to, to save us from, is to use our time on Earth efficiently, with confidence, to own your own narrative, don't let anybody co-opt your narrative. Your narrative sells information and powers, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to build your own coalition. Set up a little LLC. Just have fun with it. Give it a try. Use ChatGPT. Have fun, right? Get started and watch, watch what happens. Watch what happens. It could be really cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.